Welcome to Healing of a Nation. My name is Eric Opel, founder of the Veterans Cannabis Coalition. With me today is Candace Hawes, the executive director of Orange County Normal, the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. Before we get into it, we're going to break for, an, uh, for a word from our sponsors. AeroBloom is a proprietary patent-pending aeroponic system that reliably achieves at least double the crop yield of hydroponic cultivation. AeroBloom also uses 40 to 90% less water than hydroponics or traditional farming practices and produces a higher quality harvest with one additional crop cycle per year. At over four pounds of AAA quality trimmed flower per light and one additional harvest per year, AeroBloom is the highest producing, most efficient cultivation system in the cannabis industry. To learn more about AeroBloom, please visit their website at aerobloom.com. And to learn more about their current investment opportunity, please visit the Razzle Investment Marketplace at razzle.com. In addition to her role as the executive director of OC Normal, Candace is also the community outreach manager for Glasshouse Group, a licensed cannabis operator in the state of California. But today we're going to be talking with Candace about her role, uh, more so her role with OC Normal and her long history of advocacy in California and the role that OC Normal has played, I think, in driving some very positive uh, reforms in a place, I mean, you can get in more of this, you know, in a, in a place like Orange County that is not necessarily, uh, one would expect to be the most open to, uh, to cannabis. So with that being said, uh, I'll throw it over to you, Candace. You know, if you wouldn't mind, you know, sharing some of your, uh, some personal details and some background and how you ended up. Um, you know, as a cannabis advocate and as the executive director of what I would say is one of the more effective and most effective chapters of uh, the normal organization in the country. So we'd love to hear more. Yeah, um, it's been 17 years, so it's crazy. I'm almost 40 now, and I started this when I was just freshly, you know, moved to the state, moved to go to college. Uh, when I was in my first couple years of school, I was actually on a trip out of state and I got caught with um, an amount of cannabis that was deemed a felony in the state that I got in trouble in. Um, and I, so my life was really turned upside down. I got arrested. I had my car impounded. I had to go through the criminal justice system. I just feel like this was just really kind of crazy how much the government wanted to punish someone throughout their whole life for using cannabis. And I think the thing that affected me most about that situation is that I ended up losing my financial aid to go to college. And it really just didn't make any sense, like I said, continuing to punish people for their whole entire life. And the fact that the government wants to take away financial aid from people that they, as they say, have a drug pro problem and prevent them from rehabilitating themselves or improving their, their lives. So I really just felt like this was a, a system that was wrong. And so as soon as I got back to California, um, I did some looking on the internet and I found a couple great drug um, cannabis organizations, um, but the one that really stood out to me was normal. And so I was really lucky because it was right about the time that they're having their national conference. And so they welcomed me down and I was just amazed. Um, this was back like in 2003. Um, and so I'd always been a cannabis consumer my whole life while everyone else used alcohol, but I was always kind of by myself. You know, I was only the one always in the corner, you know, using cannabis. So to come to this conference and be surrounded by like lawyers and doctors and politicians and Woody Harrelson was there. I was like, wow, there's, you know, all these amazing people who feel the same way I do. And this isn't something that we should be ashamed of, you know? So immediately I put out the word that I wanted to start a chapter of Orange County Normal and the California Normal chapter helps spread the word. And I was just really amazed. The very first meeting that we had, I had, you know, business leader, business owners and doctors and, you know, grown men, you know, coming up, coming to these meetings and really wanting to get involved. And really that's what's kind of kept me going. You know, if I was the only one trying to do this even way back then or now, I probably wouldn't still be doing it. But surprisingly in Orange County, this is really a movement that people want to get behind. And so it's been really amazing to see throughout our 17 years, like the friendships that we forged and, you know, the connections that we've made, even people have gotten married that met each other through normal and just also the change that we've been able to be involved in, you know, back in 2003, it was, you know, patients getting arrested for cannabis, for growing cannabis. Right. So, you know, and, and the first collectives that were ever open in the state, you know, those guys were getting um, arrested and raided by the DEA. So in the very beginning, it was us just advocating for these patients and for these collective owners showing up at their raids and documenting it and having protests at you know court hearings and stuff like that and now you know the industry has definitely changed i don't think i would have ever thought you know back then that we'd be where we are where it's really kind of corporate cannabis um 
but it's amazing through the time to see how normal has changed, you know, from having protests to throwing educational conferences. And then in 2012, or yeah, 2012, we actually started um, work in Santa Ana. We saw that there was a huge problem with, you know, hundreds of dispensaries that were not regulated, you know, providing a needed service, but the city was just kind of going through this crazy kind of game with them where, you know, they'd, they'd raid them, arrest them, and then the next day the collective would be back open, and the city would come and raid them again, you know, it's just like whack-a-mole, and nothing was getting solved, and people weren't really getting safe access to medicine, so we approached the council wanting to see if they'd be interested to regulate the dispensaries, and they weren't, so we founded a PAC, which was kind of like, we were one of the first groups that ever did this, and we gathered over 20,000 signatures in Santa Ana, um, 13,000 of them were valid and we qualified for the ballot measure. And so the city actually put one up against ours. We campaigned for both. We wanted regulation, whether it was theirs or ours, we didn't care just as long as we had some sort of, you know, regulation and we could give permits to these operators. And um, surprisingly, both measures, measures actually passed in a non-presidential campaign election and also in a city that's highly Hispanic. Um, Coast, uh, Santa Ana is like at least 60%, probably Hispanic. Um, heritage. And so people said, you know, this is never going to pass. And surprisingly, like I said, both did. Ours got 54 and the city's got 60%. Um, so that was a great win for us and helped, you know, regulate this industry and provide safe access in Orange County. And then since then, we've done things like just support the Prop 64 campaign. And then now we're doing a lot of outreach and education to seniors and to other groups as well. So always keeping us busy. You know, I think our role is really to just to educate the community and to respond to whatever's going on. There's a city council meeting happening. Someone needs to be there from the cannabis um, industry to kind of advocate and make sure that our interests are also being protected. Well, I mean, you've gone over, I, I think, a pretty wide uh, selection of actions and activities that you've overseen as executive director and participated in uh, in your work with OC Normal. And I think that is a great example of how someone you know, who sees the need for something, who is willing to collaborate with others and is willing to, you know, work the, work the system and, and basically acknowledge that this, a lot of re cannabis reform is incremental in nature, right? Like yeah. California didn't start off with legalization. We had 20 years of medicinal access before we got to a, uh, a referendum, a ballot refer uh, referendum that actually passed because one was attempted in 2012 that was defeated. Um, Three times actually, back in the is, 70s. is that right? Wow. Okay. So that, I mean, that's a great example, right? Like, you know, you know, and in normal just celebrated its uh, 50th, it celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, having been founded uh, in, in 1970 uh, and been carrying the flag, uh, <laughs> you know, on cannabis reform ever since. Um, in my work with Veterans Cannabis Coalition, you know, uh, in DC, you know, we've worked with, you know, OC, with, excuse me, not OC normal, but national normal, um, and, and especially, uh, National Normal's political director, Justin Striekel, on a lot of federal legislation. Um, and after a couple, you know, after about, uh, you know, a few years in D.C., I returned to California and reached out to you because I, I saw from, you know, my research and, and reading and everything else that, like, Orange County Normal had, had shown that it had been, or that it was one of the most effective chapters in the sense that you were able to get in a conservative county in California, in a conservative city in a conservative county in California, you know, the, one of the only uh, exceptions for legal cannabis, uh, adult, excuse me, adult use cannabis. So Santa Ana in 2020 is the only city in a county of about 3 million plus people um, that allows for brick and mortar uh, cannabis retail. So, I mean, and, th and for folks who don't live in California who might not understand that, you know, despite it being legal in this state, localities have a lot of say when it comes to allowing, you know, per different types of uh, permitted cannabis operations. And most of the cities and localities in Orange County have chosen to not allow it um, in, of any kind. And, you know, occasionally you'll see, you know, exceptions of like, well, they'll allow, you know, a... Uh, uh, you know, like a delivery hub or, you know, warehouse or a testing lab or, you know, something along those, you know, those lines, but nothing in terms of like cultivation, retail, you know, manufacturing often. So, um, and Orange County in, in California is just one of 50 plus counties and they all have different approaches. You know, e every city has its own, every incorporated city in the, si in the state uh, has a say in how it, uh, 
uh, permits cannabis operations. So it really is incumbent on the citizenry to fight for it because the legislature, for the most part, will not, right? And almost in every example that we can find, it's been citizens that have pushed the legislature and not the other way around. Uh, and that continues to be the case. So, um, you know, going to something current that, uh, that OC Normal is engaged in, uh, you wouldn't mind, you know, talking a little bit about um, the work that you're doing in Anaheim, um, which, uh, again, for those, for those outside of Southern California or not familiar with California in general, Anaheim is the home of Disneyland and, uh, <laughs> and you know, has been traditionally resistant to cannabis uh, reform, largely because to some extent, the Disney Corporation was not a fan. Um, but that, you know, but all, th all things change. Uh, so we're looking at a case now where, you know, that might be, you know, a possibility. So if you wouldn't mind, you know, talking a little bit about uh, your current advocacy work there. Yeah, definitely. So one of the committees that we started recently in Orange at Orange County Normal is the Orange County Commercial Cannabis Licensing Task Force. So this is a work group whose specific purpose is to one, educate the community members that are in these cities that are licensing, because we found that the major reason that the councils aren't willing to move forward, like in Anaheim and why we had some people not really excited about the process in Fullerton was that there wasn't enough community education. Believe it or not, there's a lot of um, Latinos, especially the older generation that believe that cannabis makes you like hallucinate, that it turns you into like a heroin addict, that people that are coming to the dispensaries are dangerous and crising, causing crime to happen when they come to visit a dispensary. So it's really important that we, number one, you know, educate these people to understand that dispensaries coming into their city isn't a negative thing and that it actually has many benefits, including jobs and opportunities and tax revenue and actually gives resources to the police department. So, you know, one, one is education and the second is trying to work with the actual um, city staff and the council members to draft good ordinance, not just get something, but something that right. actually will benefit the whole industry, not just like the small cast of players that seems to open up in every city that licenses. I mean, we could probably all name, you know, the ones that we'll see pop up if the city doesn't, you know, provide regulations and opportunities for new people. Um, so this task force has really, um, really been a great thing. We have some really good people involved. We have Matt Harrison, who is actually one of the attorneys who wrote Prop 64. So it's really great to have him involved because he can speak to the intent of the law and answer a lot of questions that the city have. Um, and then also Dana Cisneros, who's a business attorney. So she's helped us with, you know, creating um, legal documents and letters and stuff. So that's really helped like elevate us. And then um, Jackie Hernandez is our new deputy director. And so she's been really great too with her management experience and her, um, you know, just experience being a true chronic, you know, patient. Um, so this is a really great um, organizing group. Um, and we've done um, a couple of cities so far. It seems right now that there's a lot of things going on, which is great. Like you said, we only have retail access in one city for 3 million people. Um, right. So in Anaheim, that city council ha unfortunately did not pass and move forward to the next step on their cannabis ordinance. They were voting whether to just place a ballot measure on the November 2020 ballot and let their citizens decide if they wanted to place a tax. And then after the tax, then they would write an ordinance. Um, but unfortunately, there's you know a lot of politics going on, a lot, a lot of infighting in that city. Um, some other tax issues ended up um, you know, interfering with this, like the city council in Anaheim wanted to pass a gate tax on Anaheim, a couple members did, but since a couple members weren't willing to vote on the gate tax, the other council members said, we're not going to vote on your cannabis tax. So it was like politics. It really was an unfortunate thing for the residents and for the business owners, but inside politics, unfortunately, shut that city down. Um, but we did have some success in Fullerton, which is where Cal State University is, probably one of the largest universities in the whole state. Um, that city council meeting, um, they decided to move it forward to the planning commission. And then after the ordinance is um, addressed by the planning commission and sent back to the council, then we'll have an opportunity to, um, to speak to the council there and hopefully uh, convince them to pass that ordinance. The Fullerton ordinance, what they're looking at right now is just five licensees in every different category of licensing, cultivation, manufacturing, retail distribution, um, which we don't feel like that's enough. We feel like, you know, they begin they began the conversation at 20. So we think 20 would be a more reasonable number in Fuller than, than just five, because we could probably sure. tell you who's going to end up opening. 
And then also right now, very timely, Costa Mesa is actually voting on whether to put an ordinance on or to put a measure on the November ballot, which would expand licensing in Costa Mesa from just manufacturing distribution testing to allow an add-on retail, which is a great thing because we already have a high number of illegal dispensaries operating there. So, you know, let's give some of these guys opportunities to follow the rules and, and do it the right way. So that's great. And then also in Stanton, that city has passed an ordinance and they're looking um, to make, um, to start the licensing process. I think they're only gonna have about one or two licenses. So not a very big opportunity there, but at least it's you know spreading it out across the county. So people don't have to drive an hour to get their medicine. And then the last one I'll, I'll mention is uh, Corona, which is our neighbor in Riverside County. So they're currently in the process of community education and they're looking at having 12 retail licenses and I think it's unlimited licenses in all the other product categories. So again, you know, we are spreading out the dispensaries across the map and really, you know, uh, expanding opportunities for people, creating new jobs, new well-paying jobs, and, you know, also expanding access to medicine. And I think you've raised like a terrific point. You know, the, I think over half the state lives in like the bottom third of the state. So between L.A., Orange County, San Bernardino, Riverside, San Diego, Imperial, you know, and, and I'm probably missing one or two, but, you know, the bulk of the counties that make up what greater Southern California have huge gaps, especially in retail access, right, which means, um, you know, that patients and consumers are having to, are having to travel, you know, incredibly long distances uh, to get medicine that is you know, at least, <laughs> you know, probably 60 to 80 percent more than what they would be paying, you know, if they were to purchase this similar things on the illicit market. Um, you know, and, and, the, and the price and affordability, uh, you know, as patient and consumer advocates uh, that we both are, right, like we know that to be a major issue as to why the state and why all states struggle to really take any, any uh, business away from the illicit market. Because every state that has approached adult use legalization has it has really leaned into high taxation, high regulation, which, you know, I, on one hand, you know, there, there are certain businesses and sectors that I think should be very highly regulated. Um, but for something like cannabis, which is a, you know, which is being framed somewhere between like a vice and nuclear waste, right? Like the, the level of state surveillance and interference in the industry has created, you know, many uh, negative repercussions uh, throughout the market. And a, lo a lot of that has been basically pricing out the vast majority of patients from the legal market, right? And, you know, let's just, you know, I'll play a little loose with numbers here, but, you know, let's say that, you know, 10% of your, of cannabis consumers in the state are the largest cannabis consumers. You know, of that 10%, I would say th they would all, you know, uh, the vast majority of them would fall into the category of being a medical patient, meaning that they rely on cannabis to manage or treat ongoing chronic and acute conditions. Uh, though that 10% is already not necessarily the best, well, the mo most financially secure, right? So you're putting a burden on the, le on the people that are least able to deal with that burden, and the state wonders why. You know, in California, there's only, it only captures about a third of the actual, of what it, they, they estimate to be the cannabis market. So, you know, in a nine, eight, nine billion dollar market, the state has about three billion dollars of it. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's definitely true. That's the number one thing I hear in, you know, feedback from customers is that the, the taxes are too high, you know, and that it's really hard to afford the medicine that they can get. So it's really great that some dispensaries have started an SB 34 program. And I know that you've been involved with that, which is amazing. And I hope that one day every dispensary and every brand has a carve out for patients that can't afford their medicine and need it. And then, you know, I also try to, you know, advocate and to promote the brands that are affordable because there actually are some brands out there that are quite affordable and that and you know, right. I always try yeah. to promote people that way, you know, because um, I have found some brands, some products that can are almost like similar to black market prices, you know, and people think that they are saving money at these illegal dispensaries or, you know, buying it from their friends or, you know, even buying hemp CBD. But the problem is that, you know, with no regulation, they could put whatever they want on those labels. So you may think you're buying a 500 milligram candy bar, but it may be 50 milligrams and they just put whatever sure. they want on that label. So are you really saving money? 
<laughs> yeah, no, right. And especially, you know, especially outside of like flour, which I think folks who are, you know, familiar with cannabis flour can kind of do that, like, you know, the smell, touch, you know, uh, you know, look test. Right. Well, no, not in legal dispensaries, but, you know, at least at least on the illicit side, uh, that's an option, which which makes sense, uh, which definitely necessitates like not being able to do that in the illicit or on the on the legal side. Um you know, it, you know the, the legal side is asking, I think, a lot of, you know, patients and consumers who are used to the illicit market and suddenly not being able to interact with their medicine in a way that they used to. Since 2008, California Lightworks has been guided by a vision focused on the research, design, development, and manufacturing of state-of-the-art commercial LED grow lights and automation equipment for greenhouse and indoor horticulture. By applying the latest advances in high-efficiency, solid-state lighting, and controls technology, their team provides worldwide growers new grow lights that deliver clear benefits at a competitive price. Backed by their solid reputation for standing behind their products, California Lightworks also offers industry-leading warranties on all their commercial grow lights. To learn more about California Lightworks, go to CaliforniaLightworks.com, and to view their current investment opportunity, please go to the investment marketplace at Razzle.com. Um, yeah, however, of course... Right. Right, of course, you know, for medical cannabis patients, there, there are a lot of other options uh, in way, and I think b probably better ways than smoking flour to, you know, to uh, get the medicinal effect of cannabis. And I always try to steer veterans, you know, to, toward non-combusting uh, alternatives. Uh, but that being said, right, like that's, that is still one of the most accessible forms, accessible forms that people have to use cannabis. So, um, and it is sort of like, you know, the one, you know, I can grow my six plants at home and I see that you have, uh, looks like you got a flowering plant. Is that, is that, uh, is that a real plant or? Oh, it's a prop. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like, that looks very healthy for sitting in the corner of your office. <laughs> but I mean, that's a great example, right? Like I can, you know, as a, as an individual adult user, adult use consumer in the state, I can grow six plants with a medicinal, um, recommendation from a doctor. You know, I can grow, I think up to 12 and have like six immature, um, you know, and, Per patient, yeah, per patient in the house, right? So while there's still some carve-outs and some protections for patients, right, most patients will never grow at home. So they, they rely on the, on the legal market uh, to, for their medicine. And because there's no real legal distinction, it, very few, excuse me, very few legal distinctions anymore between patients and, and adult-use consumers, uh, it's incumbent on folks like us, I think, to do what we can to draw the attention back to the patient. Because I think even in California, where we've come so far, there's still a lot we can do uh, to make every, you know, to make the industry more equitable, to make it more accessible, to low, you know, to lower affordability barriers. Um, and I think the patient has to be at the forefront of that. Uh, you know, and veterans in this, veterans and patients in the state have already shown their ability. Um, you know, to to get change uh, done at the at the federal or excuse me at the state level, uh, Sweet Leaf Collective, Weed for Warrior Project, uh, Operation Evac, um, and the group known as Team Compassion uh, worked with uh, Senator uh, uh, Scott Weiner last year, or excuse me, since 2018, and has and worked to pass SB 34, which is a law in the state of California that allows. Um, licensed cannabis operators to designate products uh, for compassionate donation. And any patient, anyone with a medical recommendation in the state or with a state issued card is eligible to receive those donations. Uh, now, how they organize those programs and, and how they identify patients is pretty much up to the dispensary. And that's why organizations like OC Normal and Veterans Cannabis Coalition come in and we try to uh, provide some of the administrative and, uh, you know, and back-end support um, to make that, to make those kind of programs successful. Although, r literally any retail operator can, in, can single-handedly, um, you know, choose to, to, choose to donate products. It always makes more sense to try to organize the supply chain, and based on the, the way California tax, uh, cannabis taxes are collected, to get everybody to say, yes, you know, from the cultivator, um, you know, through the distributor to the retail partner, right? We're all, you know, we're we're designating these products for for donation, and that way you're bringing the, the actual cost of the donation down to whatever it costs for labor and production, um, and that becomes a lot more sustainable for businesses who, prior to SB 34, were had to pay the uh, essentially the 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 retail price for their products, 
in order to donate them, which was not really something that almost any company um, had the financial uh, security to do so. Beyond a handful of very uh, dedicated, um, you know, companies like uh, Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance, who has made, uh, you know, compassionate donations, especially to veterans, a major part of their business model. Um, all right, so I guess on that note, uh, well, I'll, I'll pitch it back to you, and I say, you know, if there's anything that you, you know, if you want to, if you'd like to plug OC Normal and the, and the task force and, um, you know, tell viewers how they can uh, participate if they're in Orange County or potentially support if they like the work that you're doing. Definitely. Yeah, everyone can always check out our website, orangecountynormal.org, and you can find out where, um, when and where our meetings are. Right now, they're on Zoom, obviously, um, which makes it really easy for everyone to attend, and we have really great guests. Um, and then also, if you want to find out about the task force, and if you want to apply to be a member, then that link is also on the front page of our website. So please definitely come check out our website and uh, feel free to get involved and reach out if you have any questions. Yes, and, be, and definitely if you're an, you know, a legal operator in Orange County or Southern California or want to do business in Orange County or Southern California, I, you know, Candace and OC Normal is you know, the organization to, to support because they're working to expand access for the entire industry, uh, which is very rare, um, you know, even in a state that has organized so successfully for cannabis reform in the past. So thank, thank you, you so much, Candace always get overlooked, you know, so it's always great to, you know, support organizations like Feds Cannabis Coalition and Orange County Normal, and we definitely make that money go a lot really far. <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're some of the cheapest advocates you're going to buy, let's just put it that way. Um, so thank you again, Candice, thank you for the work that you're doing and the work that you're continuing to do. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure there will be more opportunities for us to get together and talk, and so I look forward to that. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day.